Hello, I'm author and historian Brian Thomas Kopak, and welcome to my new channel, Civil War Reports. I will be your War of the Rebellion reporter as I bring to you the events of the American Civil War as they unfolded. It is my intention to not only report to you from here, the parlor of my home, but also to take you on location to the battlefields and other historical sites that have made Civil War history. We're going to look not only at the battles and the battlefields, but as well as the people, the men and the women who made Civil War history. We will examine not only the war, but we will look at the causes and the events that have led up to the American Civil War, as well as the war itself and the aftermath, that which we consider to be the Reconstruction Era. While I would love to bring you this in chronological order, it's simply not possible for me to do that because I intend to take you on location when I can to the places that made Civil War history. So with that said, for episode number one, we're going to look at an event that is near and dear to my heart. I live just a few miles from the Gettysburg battlefield, and the event we're going to look at today is what I like to consider the first shots of the American Civil War's largest battle, the Battle of Gettysburg. And no, it did not occur on July 1st, 1863. The first shots of Gettysburg, in my opinion, occurred a few days earlier, on June 26th, 1863, for it was on that day that Jubal Early's Confederate division invaded the town of Gettysburg. I'm in Caledonia, Pennsylvania, about 15 miles west of Gettysburg, and it was on the morning of June 26 that Jubal Early was marching down the Chambersburg Pike, today's modern Route 30, when he came across Thaddeus Stevens' ironworks. Thaddeus Stevens was a radical Republican, a staunch abolitionist, and a fierce supporter of total war against the South. When Jubal Early came upon the ironworks here, he decided it was time to extract a little Southern revenge against the radical Republican. Although the ironworks that were located here never made Thaddeus Stevens any money, he kept them open to provide jobs for the local poor. Despite pleas from the superintendent not to burn the ironworks or to vandalize the workers' housing, Jubal Early's men did just that. The ironworks were completely destroyed. The building behind me is the only building that has remained here in Caledonia. The rest of the grounds that compose the ironworks are now a state park, which you can visit. This building, although gutted, was rebuilt and by 1870 was once again functioning as a, a blacksmith shop. And it remained so until 1895. Once the ironworks were destroyed and any material that Jubal Early felt could aid the Confederate war effort were confiscated. His men then continued east along the Chambersburg Pike and towards Gettysburg. Although Lee had issued orders not to destroy private property, Jubal Early on this morning would prove why Lee named him his bad old man. I'm now about a mile and a half west of Cashtown, standing at a fork in the road with the Chambersburg Pike, modern day old Route 30 on my right, and Hilltown Road on my left. After destroying Thaddeus Stevens' ironworks, Jubal Early put his division in motion and continued their march towards Gettysburg. About a quarter of a mile west of where I stand, four local bushwhackers decided they wanted to take some action against the Confederates. One of them, a gentleman by the name of Henry Hahn, was armed with a rifle. He shot and killed one of General Gordon's Georgian troops. This infuriated Jubal Early. By the time he got to this fork in the road, he had already learned that there was a Union force in and around Gettysburg. Not sure of the size and strength or composition of this force, Jubal Early decided to split his division, sending General Gordon's men down the Chambersburg Pike along with most of White's cavalry Jubal Early marched his other three divisions and some cavalry escorts down Hilltown Road. It would be Jubal Early's men, along with White's cavalry, that would first intercept this Union force of unknown size and strength. Jubal Early, continuing down Hilltown Road, took it all the way to the end, which would take you to modern-day Mummersburg Road. Once there, he turned right and continued into Gettysburg, taking him past the modern-day Peace Light and into Gettysburg from the north. 
The infantry that Jubal Early was so concerned about turned out to be the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry. Mustered in the Federal Service only four days earlier on June 22nd, these 748 men under the command of William Jennings, accompanied by a squadron of cavalry under the command of Robert Bell, proved to be absolutely no match for Gordon's Confederate veterans and White's cavalry. They positioned themselves here along Route 30, the Chambersburg Pike, about one-tenth of a mile east of Marsh Creek and about two and a half miles west of Seminary Ridge. After a very brief skirmish, the men of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry broke and ran, fleeing about four miles north of Gettysburg to a place called Bailey's Hill, where they encountered Jubal Early's men coming in from the north. After another brief skirmish there, the men broke and ran. Most of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry were taken prisoners. Company A of the 26th Pennsylvania Infantry was composed of men from both Gettysburg College and the town of Gettysburg. Again, most of these men were taken prisoner. Only about a hundred returned to their base of operations in Harrisburg. The first Confederates to arrive in town were White's Cavalry. Waving their swords and firing their pistols in the air, they created general chaos, disorder, and mayhem, and frightening the daylights out of the local inhabitants. Order would not start to be restored until General Gordon arrived with his brigade shortly thereafter, and full control of the town would not be restored until Jubal Early arrived with the rest of his division, his other three brigades, who came into town from the north. When Jubal Early arrived on the scene, he demanded a ransom of the town. When Council Borough President David Kendall Hart informed Jubal Early that he was unable to meet the Confederates' demand for a ransom, he did state that he would order all of the local shopkeepers to open up their shops and allow the Confederates to take what they wanted. This counteroffer appeased General Early, and he agreed that he would spare the town in lieu of taking what he wanted from the local shopkeepers. Tilly Pierce, who was a young girl at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, lived here in this house at the corner of Breckenridge and Baltimore Pike. She would write in her memoirs years later how her father described the Confederates as being as dirty as the street. She also wrote about how she begged the Confederates not to take her family's prized horse. Crying and in tears, she begged the soldiers not to take the animal, but in the end, the Confederates made off with her horse. I'm currently standing on East Cemetery Hill. While Jubal Early's men were taking from the town any and all goods and materials they thought would aid their war effort, Jubal Early took the time to survey the grounds in and around Gettysburg. He noted the hills and valleys, and much of the ground that he surveyed on June 26th would be the same ground that his men would fight on on July 2nd. After taking what he wanted from the town, Jubal Early continued on his mission eastward towards York. On his way out of town, he found several railroad cars loaded with supplies and 2,000 army rations that were sent here to feed the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry. The rations were divided among Gordon's troops, and Jubal Early burned the railroad bridge that was above Rock Creek. There are over 1,200 monuments and markers here at Gettysburg, each one telling its own unique individual story about regiments, brigades, divisions, corps, and in some cases giving you a brief overview of the armies themselves. And in some cases, there are even monuments to individuals. The monument behind me is dedicated to the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry. It is located along the Chambersburg Pike and Spring Avenue. 
Once the 26th Pennsylvania was pushed aside by Gordon and White's troops just a few miles west from where this monument stands, the town of Gettysburg laid virtually defenseless and Jubal Early could do whatever he wanted. Luckily, he did not live up to Lee's reputation as being a bad old man here at Gettysburg. Unlike what he did earlier that day to Thaddeus Stevens Ironworks, Jubal Early basically took what he wanted and left. However, it was also here on June 26th that the Union Army would suffer its first fatality here at Gettysburg. A gentleman by the name of George Sando, who was serving in Bell's cavalry, raised his pistol to the Confederates and he was shot dead. From what I understand, he was a paid substitute for someone else. He was basically trying to make a few extra dollars and he was killed for that effort. Jubal Early, once he achieved what he wanted to here at Gettysburg, he continued his mission and head eastward towards York. But that is for another episode. I want to thank you for tuning in. For Civil War Reports, I am your War of the Rebellion reporter, Brian Thomas Kopak. Hope you tune in again soon. Thank you. And if you would like to read up more about this topic, the main sources I used to bring this report to you were Jubal Early's Memoirs, Gettysburg, A Testing of Courage by Noah Andre Trudeau, Stephen Sears' book on the Gettysburg Campaign, as well as Tilly Pierce's book at Gettysburg, or What a Young Girl Saw and Heard of the Battle, and Jubal Early's own after-action report, which can be found in the official records of the War of the Rebellion. And if you like what you saw today, please hit the subscribe button. Give a thumbs up. Also, notify your friends. Let them know about this channel and ask them to subscribe as well. If you like, you may leave a question or a comment below, and perhaps I will answer your question in a future episode of Civil War Reports. Until next time, please keep the history alive.